I have the great honor to introduce to you Dr. Bahram Qiyasi. Dr. Qiyasi has been active in nuclear non-proliferation, nuclear disarmament, and nuclear security. He's going to be speaking with us today in regards to the policies and the dangers of Iran becoming a nuclear power. Uh, Dr. Bahram is a member of the International Nuclear Law Association in Brussels and the International Nuclear Security Forum in Washington, D.C. He is also a uh, chartered member of the UK Nuclear Institute and recipient of the Institute's prestigious Picker Pinkerton Prize in 2011. Wonderful indeed. He also holds a dual master in international law uh, from UCL and nuclear science and technology PhD from Imperial College London. It's my honor. Uh, firstly, well, thank you for being here and uh, for giving your support, lending your support to a young Iranian men, woman and men who are being maimed, who are being tortured, who are being raped and being murdered by this uh, rogue regime in Iran. Well, in fact, uh, the next question, I mean, the next point is whether what would happen if Iran became a nuclear weapon, nuclear power in the sense that it, it, it acquires nuclear weapons. Of course, that will establish Iran as a major uh, power in the region and we shall see uh, a prolonged period where Moldavs will be uh, uh, imposing their will on the young in, this country, in Iran. Uh, in fact, the topic of this talk is uh, Iran and nuclear diplomacy. But basically, I'm going to talk about uh, the clandestine operations of Iran, activities of Iran in the nuclear sphere, and uh, in order to have a very clear picture of what they have been doing behind the scenes, behind the door, closed doors, one needs to go back to 1980s. In the latter part of 1980s, when the Iran-Iraq war was coming to an end, suddenly the authorities in Iran woke up and realized that, well, nuclear power is a useful thing. You know, and in fact, they started acquiring and, uh, the, and started the program of the acquisition of nuclear materials, nuclear technology, and in fact, uh, simultaneously, Iranians started uh, on the road to acquiring uh, missiles and drone technologies. This is very interesting because one complements the other. And in fact, Iran, in around 1988, started signing agreements with China. China was one of the major partners of Iran in equipping Iran with nuclear material and nuclear technology and nuclear installations. It is very interesting, China, since 1989. So Iran started signing agreements with China with uh, Russia, with Pakistan. In fact, these countries were instrumental in creating the nuclear technology uh, and, the, and the nuclear materials for Iran. In fact, in addition to signing agreements with these countries, uh, Iran also started negotiating with a gentleman called Abdul Ghadir Khan. Mr. Khan, Dr. Khan was a Pakistani nuclear scientist. Well, in fact, he was a metallurgist, but he, was, he is known as the father of Pakistan nuclear bomb. In fact, he uh, was negotiating with Iran, and in fact, millions were paid to him in uh, Dubai and in Malaysia and elsewhere, and Mr. Dr. Khan actually sold the uh, uranium enrichment technology to Iran, both in terms of design and the actual components for these centrifuges. And uh, he, also, he also sold Iran a blueprint 
it, a, a, the struct for <laughs> the recipe for making a bomb, nuclear weapons. This is very interesting. Abdul Ghadir Khan, Dr. Khan was of course supported by the, by the Pakistani army. He was not a rogue person. He had a huge network and he had also sold the same technology to Libyans and to North Koreans. That is very interesting. In fact, so in the 1990s, we see Iran actually acquiring every aspect of nuclear technology needed for both military and civilian uh, aspects of nuclear power. As we know, uh, nuclear technology uh, has, uh, is called dual use applications. Just like a knife, which could be used to cut a birthday cake, it could also be used to stab someone. So nuclear technology is very much a dual use, has dual use applications. And, uh, and Iran was, of course, fully aware of this, and it was pursuing, of course, both. In the 1990s, Iran, Iran's nuclear technology flourished, mostly behind the scenes, except for one agreement with Russia, with Russia, it was for the, it was for the reconstruction um, uh, of the Boucher nuclear power plant. So mostly clandestine, mostly covertly done. And in fact, in late uh, 1990s, Iran started a formal nu nuclear weapons program. Uh, and th that is, of course, well documented. An international atomic energy organization has actually as a report on this. Now, in fact, Mr. Fakhri Zadeh, who was, who was executed, well, who was murdered, <laughs> executed. Sorry. Government sanction, sanction murder. Exactly. In 2020, he was actually the head of that nuclear weapons program. Uh, so this is in the 90s, and we see the nuclear technology in Iran flourishing both the military aspects and civilian aspects. And in fact, in year 2002, something very interesting happened. At a press conference in Washington, D.C., in the summer of 2002, the uh, National, Iran National Council of Resistance of Iran, as we call them, the Mujahideen Khal, they actually disclosed at a press conference that Iran is building uh, a, uh, two uh, nuclear facilities uh, without the knowledge of the International Atomic Energy Agency and without the knowledge of any international entity for that matter. In fact, they mentioned that one was in Natanz, which is the uh, uh, uranium enrichment plant, and the other one was in Iraq, a heavy water reactor. Now the question is, what are, what, what's the, what, what are the significance of these two plants? Why Iran was building these two plants? And why Iran was not informing the IAEA, the International Atomic Energy Agency? What, what, why? In fact, the, uh, the Natanz fuel enrichment plant, sorry, uranium enrichment plant, the product at the end of the day is enriched uranium, which is used both for reactors, nuclear power plants, and for nuclear weapons. In fact, the very first atomic bomb or nuclear weapon that was used, of course, thank God it wasn't used again, if there is one. Uh, in fact, the Americans, as you know, dropped a bomb on Hiroshima. Hiroshima bomb was actually made of enriched uranium, around 80% enriched uranium. So Iran, of course, like many other countries, was aware of this, and uh, so we decided to go on, on that route. And so, in fact, many countries at the moment, their nuclear weapons are actually based on enriched uranium. Now, that is why the significance of Natanz, uranium enrichment plant. But what about the heavy water rea uh, plant at Iraq? In fact, Heavy water, uh, heavy water and heavy water reactors are actually used to generate plutonium. 
the other type of material used for nuclear weapons. In fact, the second bomb dropped on, uh, that Americans dropped on Nagasaki was actually made of plutonium. Only six kilograms of plutonium, six kilograms, the size of a tennis ball, because plutonium is very dense. Uh, so Iran, of course, was aware of this. The Islamic Republic was aware of the fact that that is another route to go down to, to actually acquire nuclear materials for whatever purpose they had in mind. So this is in 2002. In fact, the, the revelations actually was, these were startling revelations. In fact, they, they were worrying. They were, and the International Atomic Energy Agency, the Director General, Dr. Al Baraday, who was extremely concerned about this issue, he, in, in November of that year, he, he traveled to Iran and decided and to find out what, what is going on and what else is there? What else is happening in Iran? And in fact, uh, he was extremely dismayed by the fact that he was not informed prior to prior to these revelations, and so, uh, of course, uh, and a few months later in 2003, of course, we have the Iran-Iraq war. The Americans and the Brits started destroying that country, and they did it beautifully. Iran suddenly realized, you know, the, Tehran could be next. Baghdad was totally bombarded and destroyed, so Tehran could be next. So the Iranians actually made an agreement with the International Atomic Energy Agency to allow them to come into Iran and do intrusive inspections of Iran's nuclear facilities. That is very interesting. So for the first time, the doors opened and the IAEA arrived in Iran with all their inspectors and looked everywhere. And, sorry. Iran also signed an agreement with uh, Germany, France, uh, and the UK. The, uh, the agreement was called Sadabad uh, Agreement. Sadabad in the, of course, Koch Sadabad, the one of the Shah's palaces. And, uh, the agreement was that uh, Iran receives uh, cert certain concessions from European countries in terms of trade, and these countries keep an eye on Iran's nuclear developments. In fact, this actually Iranians abided by this, and ir ir the doors were opened, and the IEA inspectors were all over. That, that wasn't a problem until we had a political tsunami in 2005, I call it a political tsunami because this, this hardliner, illiterate, backward uh, idiot suddenly <laughs> arrived on the scene and his name is, of course, we know who he was. Ahmadinejad, yes. This, well, we have a president who is a hardliner, who is, you know, is actually comes from the, from the grassroots of the uh, revolutionary core, yes, Islamic, excellent, Islamic revolutionary core. And so he said, no, you know, I have not signed anything, I have not promised anything. <laughs> so he stopped all the inspections. He stopped cooperation with the, Amer with the French, Germans, uh, UK, uh, stopped uh, any, any communications whatsoever, and uh, started building and advancing Iran's nuclear program, which he did beautifully, I must say. <laughs> I mean, I, the only credit he should be given is that he actually <laughs> did a very good job. <laughs> I do recall very clearly the, the oil was $100 per barrel. And he, they were selling a lot of oil. And so the money, the oil revenue, was actually being channeled into purchasing nuclear technology from China, from the Eastern Bloc, who were now independent, all these countries. And they had nuclear material. They had nuclear scientists. 
who had no jobs. And so uh, the, the Ahmadinejad, in that sense, did very well in equipping Iran with, 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 with every aspect of nuclear technology. Uh, however, the, uh, of course, the IAEA, International Atomic Energy Agency, was extremely unhappy with this. So they wrote to the UN Security Council saying that Iran is in non-compliance with its obligations. So the U UN Security Council in 2006 actually passed the first resolution which sanctioned Iran for not cooperating with the IAEA. So that was the very first sanctions and these sanctions continued. There were seven sanctions in total until 2011, 12. And then, of course, the, U the European sanctions, the, the US sanctions. So Iran was very much under pressure. In fact, it's very interesting. Ahmadinejad did not, did not change his policies. It, he carried on until 2009. In 2009, there was a press conference this time, Obama, Mr. Brown, and Sarkozy of France, Mr. Brown of Britain. These three at a uh, summit, the G G20 summit, they announced that Iran has actually developed a, 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 another secret facility, in, this time in Fordu, 60 meters inside the mountain. 60 meters. So the bunker buster bombs that the US had developed to, uh, were not effective. Even they were not effective. In fact, the, this site is actually belong to IRGC, Islamic Republic Corps. They, they had their base there, and they decided to keep it secret. It was secret. It was truly, truly a secret facility designed to enrich uranium for military purposes. So in, that was in 2009. Again, more sanctions. And uh, Iran was really uh, economically under pressure uh, until 2012. Uh, of course, the second uh, round of presidency of uh, Ahmadinejad was over. And, a, so, and uh, in 2013, Rouhani became president. Rouhani was a moderator, well, whatever they are. I mean, they're basically the same thing, but less, less ugly. It was less ugly, less, uh, less of a whatever. So he actually, he was the new president. He was elected, not elected, but selected as president. We don't have elections in Iran. So he was selected as president, and of course, there was the, the economy was in such tatters that it was they, the Iran decided to actually cooperate with the IAEA, cooperate with the West, and in 2013 they gather in Geneva, and an agreement was signed, and the, the it was called joint. Uh, sorry. Well, that was the precursor to J JCPOA. The C was missing. It was called the uh, Joint uh, Plan of Action, Joint Plan of Action in 2013. $7 billion of Iranian money, monies, funds, uh, dollar, in dollar, dollar funds were released, and uh, Iran started to sell oil. And in 2015, as Eli reminded me, it was the JCPOA, which is, was the nuclear deal, which was finalized uh, in, uh, in July of 2015. And, and a week later, United Nations Security Council passed, adopted a resolution endorsing JCPOA, this nuclear deal, JCPOA, and removing all the sanctions. So all the international sanctions were removed. European sanctions were removed. Uh, U.S. sanctions were removed, even New Zealand, even Australia, Switzerland, all these countries who had unilateral sanctions, they were all removed. 
So this was 2015. Everything was rosy. Everything was rosy in 2015, 17. Of course, suddenly we have an orange tsunami. We have another idiot arriving on the scene in, the, in a very <laughs> orange color this time. I think his inspiration was Ahmadinejad. His inspiration must have been Ahmadinejad. In terms of Trump? Yes. Oh, yeah. He had copied. He, he copied. He, he did. Very much so. In fact, I think they, they must have the same DNA. <laughs> Seriously. Because, <laughs> sorry? No, seriously, they were. So, in two, so we, we were, everything was rosy, everything was working well, and the inspectors of atomic, International Atomic Energy were in Iran, agency, sorry, International Atomic Energy Agency, were in Iran, inspecting everything, and so Trump actually kicked the bucket and spilled all the milk, and so a year later, Iranians said, well, you know, if you are not uh, fulfilling your commitments under the nuclear deal, under the JCPOA, so why should we? And they gradually, incrementally uh, stopped fulfilling their obligations and their commitments uh, until, uh, until now. In fact, here we are in 2023. In fact, the very latest IAEA, International Atomic Energy Agency report says very clearly, in fact, I printed it and highlighted it, Iran has some, something like 450 kilograms of enriched uranium at 20%. This is equivalent to two materials for two nuclear weapons. Iran also has 90 kilograms of enriched uranium at 60% equivalent to two more uh, weapon materials, so Iran can actually, if it decides to, it can actually start working towards manufacturing four nuclear weapons, nu nuclear bombs, because it has the enough material. Now the question is, does Iran need to test the des des design its weapons and then test its weapons? Now the answer is, in my view, no because Iran had already had a program of designing. So the design, is, it was there, and it was done two decades ago. Now the question is, what about testing? Does Iran need to test its nuclear weapon? The answer again, in my view, no. Why? Because Iran has very close ties with North Korea, North Korea, since 2006, t has tested six nuclear weapons underground. So it has actually completed the testing, the design and testing of nuclear weapons. Now, Iran has very close ties with North Korea. We know that. Iran sells oil to North Korea. So in return, Iran must have, in my view, it must have received the technology for designing the bomb and, and of course the information is there for there is no need to test because the design is based on the testings of North Korea. And Iran actually, thanks to, it's thanks to Korea that Iran has the, the advanced missile systems. It's purely North Korean and of course the, the Koreans got it from Chinese and the Russians. So Iran has the capability, if it wishes to, uh, build nuclear weapons. But, and if it does, it's not to attack Israel or any other country, because Israel actually developed the bomb in 1968. They have some 100 nuclear weapons. They can annihilate Iran in no time. This nonsense that the, the Islamic Republic you know, claims that you know, we are World stay, we will, we, we will level Israel. This is all nonsense for internal consumption. There is nothing they can do. And so acquiring a nuclear weapon for Iran means that the regime will be sitting there safe and sound for many decades to come. 
And that is the point. Now, one last thing before I, if I may. I, in fact, r currently there are a number of issues regarding the clandestine operations of Iran. Currently, right now. In fact, there are four sites that the IAEA has been asking Iran to clarify as to why there are radioactive materials and, par and, and uh, particles of uranium on these four sites, and Iran, for the past three years, has refused to clarify the situation. That's one, there are four unresolved issues that Iran and IEA are trying to resolve, but, but Iran is not coming forward. The other thing is, where are the equipment that contaminated these sites? So IEA is asking, where are the equipment? Where are the materials? We, we can see the fingerprints, but when there are fingerprints, it means there's something else behind it. Where are they? Where are the nuclear equipment and materials? This is another issue. And finally, in January, IAEA inspectors fo found 84% enriched uranium at Fordu, that notorious place that in 2009, 60 meters inside the mountain, they found particles of uranium uh, enriched to 84%. But that's nuclear, that can easily, they can easily make bombs. But, but of course, there isn't, so IEA is saying, why did you not inform us in advance? And what, how did this happen? So this is another unresolved issue that the IEA and Iran are grappling with. So the clandestine operations of Iran is, are proceeding, and the future can be very grim. And one last thing, uh, if I may, Fari, and is the question of JCPOA. What is to happen with the Iran nuclear accord? And the answer is JCPOA will terminate in 2015. So Iran the U.S. And, and all the other countries, China, Russia, the, the five permanent members who are signatory, who are, the, uh, who, who are part of the JCPOA, but they call them um, the participatory states, right, because it's, it's a political agreement. Uh, so into everybody will try to drag this on until 2025, October to 2025, when JCPOA dies anyway. So that, yeah, okay, thank so that's, you. that's super interesting. So two years so of dragging you. it out. You know, what was really interesting was I heard from people in Iran that um, the International Atomic Inspection Agency, when they go to Iran, they announce with so much uh, forward notice that they're coming that it's an open secret in the country that they clear everything out and take it away so if if we all know that and they must themselves suspect that are they just literally going through the motions because they've been told to um, what do you think their actual goals are what how ineffective are they and how much do they know how ineffective sure. they are thank you uh, in fact one should actually emphasize that in 2003 when Iran signed the second agreement with IAEA, when you know, in the shadow of the Iraq, in the shadow of the U.S.-U.K. attack on on, on on Iraq, Iran signed the second agreement in, with the IAEA in relation to inspection and verification, yeah, of its nuclear activities. That was a very intrusive. It's called additional protocol. The additional protocol is, is one of the most intrusive mechanisms by which IAEA can go anywhere, can, can collect samples anywhere. In fact, it can go somewhere without notice. So in 2003, Iran agreed with this new uh, approach to inspection with the IAEA. And in 2005, when the tsunami appeared on the landscape and seascape of Iran. Mr. Tsunami, he said, I didn't sign that uh, additional protocol. Inspectors cannot come. 
So that happened. However, when JCPOA was implemented in January 2016, the additional protocol was reinstated. So the inspectors of IAEA were there without notice, not even one hour notice. They could just go anywhere they wanted. And that is how they discovered that there are particles of uranium radioactive, radioactive contamination in f these four sites where Iran had not previously declared it. That is interesting. So the Western countries are saying, well, let's go back to the JCPOA so that the, or the IEA inspectors could go back in. I mean, in full. They're there already. But without notice, anywhere they want to go, any samples they want to take. And of course, the Americans are dragging their feet, and Iran is dragging its feet, and I think everybody wants to get to that 2025. Uh, dear Mr. Faiz. Well, uh, thank you very much for this very informative uh, speech. Uh, very, very helpful. Uh, and I, uh, I want to also thank you for uh, demystifying two myths. One is that sanctions had only been imposed by the United States, and we know that they were actually initially imposed by the Security Council. And many people don't know that, and they think that you know, it is only the United States who actually imposed sanctions on Iran, and therefore you know, it is the body. Exactly. And the, yes, uh, the uh, second thing is that also I would like to especially <laughs> acknowledge and thank you is that you, re you, you raised the uh, uh, point that China had a very important Extremely. role to play in the development of not only nuclear uh, facilities in Iran but also in Pakistan, in Saudi Arabia if you like, in all sorts of other states in the region. And for many, actually, Iranians, uh, they still have to really wake up to the fact that it is no longer really the United States that is oh. trying to exploit the uh, kind of you know, vulnerabilities and the repressiveness of the regimes in, in the area, the, dictator, the dictators. Uh, they are not exploiting, it's not the United States that are exploiting that. Uh, for a number of reasons, but, also, but it is China, really, and, exactly. and their proxy, which is, uh, you know, North Korea and so on. Okay. So those are really very good. But uh, a, second point, a third point that you actually raised, and I would like you to actually uh, uh, comment on that, was, uh, I mean, we, our understanding, my understanding, is that all these uh, 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 presidents in Iran uh, they don't seem to be really real presidents. They, they have no power, no. and the power is vested with, the, with one person, and regardless of who comes to you know, power as a president, exactly. whether it is uh, Ahmadinejad or uh, Rouhani, or even if you like you know, Khatami, uh, they're all really being controlled by, <laughs> by Khamenei, as we know. Oh, and, yeah. uh, and really, in a way, I mean, he is the one who has the final responsibility for the mess that the country is yes. in, rather than, I just wondered if you agree with that. Well, I 100%, because the presidents in Iran are actually appointed, not elected. Iranian people don't elect, or for that matter, the members of parliament. These are symbolic I mean, the parliament is a loudspeaker. It's a mere loudspeaker. And of course, the presidents are nobodies. In fact, this Raisi is truly a nobody. Because, I mean, he, at least the other two, had, had, you know, had some. They had a school past the university. Yes. He hasn't even been to high school. Exactly. So this one is. Uh, but in fact, back to China. In fact, it's very interesting that China, the point you made regarding China is very interesting. In 1990, in fact, in 1989, it started. Iran 
agreement, uh, cooperations with China's cooperation with Iran regarding nuclear weapon, nuclear programs. In 1990, China started exploring and extracting uranium from Iranian uranium mines in, in early 90s. China is doing the exact thing in Saudi Arabia right now, as you mentioned. It's exploring, extract, exploring and extract and trying to extract. In fact, they have found a few small uranium mines but, but the Saudis were hoping they, they'll, they, they'll find a few big ones which they haven't yet. So Saudis are, spend a lot of money and they're very disappointed. The Chinese just gobbled it. So is that why China is now was acting as a broker between Saudi Arabia and Iran? And Iran? That's correct. Yes, well, we have an expert on China sitting there. Uh, but, no, but. but that is so, because China is present in the Middle East, in, the, in South Asia. China is present everywhere now, in Africa. Uh, in Iran? It's literally colonized Iran. Oh, very much so, the 25-year program. Yes, in fact, Iran, well, China is a powerful country. Sorry, uh, my dear friend. No, uh, that's okay. Uh, my name is Reza Hossein Bor. I'm curious to know how close the Islamic Republic is to building a bomb and why the regime is insisting so much in building this bomb, in reaching uranium, and uh, clearly, it doesn't seem that we have uh, an enemy, that we know that that country is our enemy. Of course, all the countries of the world are against the regime. The Arabs, the Turks, the Afghans, the Pakistanis, and the Europeans. Iran has made all of them their enemies. But I wonder where they may use it. Is it possible if they make it, they may use it in parts of Iran, like Baluchistan, that they have mm, already organized 3,100,000 3, marches. 3,100,000 3, marches uh, in Zahedan. Kur Kurdistan could be the same thing. So where they are going to use it? Well, well, thank you very much for two interesting comments. Firstly, Iran is, if it wishes to build one, it can build one. But the point is, it is not for offensive purposes. It's only to, for the, for, exactly, and the image and to, for the, to sustain its own existence, for its own existence, for Baha'i Chodesh. Yeah. It, that's because, why? Because Israel, Iran, claiming that it, it wants to level Israel. Well, Israel can finish Iran in no time because it has all, you know, more, around 100 nuclear weapons. And Israel can use nuclear weapons on Iran because it's, they're about 2,000 kilometers apart, so the radio, radio, radioactivity and the radioactive fallout is, it will not affect Israel. However, if Iran were to use the nuclear weapon on, say, Balochistan or Kurdistan, then the whole of Iran will be contaminated with radioactive material. And hence, it, it is not feasible for Iran to use it within its own territory. That is why it is very unlikely that Russia will use a nuclear weapon in Ukraine, because Russians don't know how the wind may blow. It may blow right over Russia and contaminate the west of Russia. So it's, you know, it's for their own, to, to sustain their own existence. And for yes. As an insurance uh, policy. Insurance policy. Thank you. Thank you.
I have one question. So you mentioned something regarding the nuclear waste. Yeah. What are they doing? Is I've um, had a few. I've read a few articles regarding the high count of cancer patients in Natanz, in Esfahan, and there is um, suspicions that this is all because of nuclear waste being dumped into our nature and in natural environment of Iran. Where do we stand with that? Well, uh, well, there are numerous r reports, but I haven't seen one from IAEA suggesting that there are cases of, uh, say, cancer directly, directly related to nuclear activities in Iran. Of course, IAEA is very conservative, so we, should, we need to know that. But, but uh, the point is, uh, the uranium mines in Sagan, south of Yazd, uh, in fact, the villages around Sagan have been uh, there are reports that children are, uh, have been developing. Uh, birth de defects. Sorry? Do they have birth defects? Birth defects and also developing different types of cancer because of the uranium dust which is flowing everywhere. So that, is, uh, that, that has been reported here and there. And also uh, in Anorak, the, the nuclear waste very little amounts of nuclear waste that Iran generates is actually stored in Anorak. And again, there are reports that you know, it's leaking and it's causing uh, environmental and uh, public health uh, issues are being uh, raised and its impact on public health. And so that, in fact, it's very interesting. It is also said that the environmentalists who were imprisoned in Iran, as you know, and one of them was murdered in, the, in prison. In fact, it is said, not official, that these people were taking samples. You know, it was their job, and they were also the uh, Iranian cheetah and Iranian. Uh, uh, Cheetah and the lizards were before. Yeah, even yeah, the the wildlife. Yeah, so yeah. In fact, the of course radioactivity affects uh, wildlife. So environmental impact, as I mentioned earlier. So all these issues are are being raised. However, Iran's uh, Iran is not generating that much r radioactive waste as yet. But, but yes, especially around the mining areas and Ardakan. Uh, but the problem is, if Israel decides to attack Iran, it's Iran's nuclear facilities, we have a nuclear reactor, research reactor in Tehran, Amirabad Shomali, in north, north of Tehran. We have a number of research reactors in Isfahan. We have nuclear facilities with Chinese, thanks to Chinese. Massive, massive advance in, in Isfahan Nuclear Research Center and Nuclear Technology Center, two centers. Then we have, uh, in, in, of course, we have the, the Boucher nuclear power plant. Of course, Israelis will not attack the Boucher power plant because it belongs because the Russians are there. But but it, Iran's nuclear facilities could be attacked. And in fact, I wrote, uh, my dear friends know, I wrote a, a paper, a, a report last year on the vulnerability of Iran's nuclear facilities to drone strikes and, of course, to missiles and to rockets. And it's extremely vulnerable. And if that happens, then the amount of radioactivity that will be released will be devastating. Thank you.